And before going to Hopkins, uh, Matthew had training at the University of Oregon and then got his master's and PhD at the University of Vermont, had a whole world of behavioral pharmacology before going to the world of Johns Hopkins, with which you are more familiar. Uh, since the time at Hopkins, he's obviously been at the leading edge of this surging psychedelic research domain. He began that work in 2004 when he joined Roland and the team at Hopkins. And Matt and his team are really responsible for this 2008 psychedelic safety guidelines that sort of enabled field to move forward and laid the foundation for a lot of the ongoing therapeutic work with psychedelics. He and his colleagues have led a ton of rigorous studies on the impact of psychedelic treatment. They've worked with tobacco disorder, anxiety and cancer distress, and they have ongoing studies now, not yet completed on opioid use disorder and PTSD. And though these treatment studies use psilocybin, he's actually led, supervised hundreds of clinical sessions. He's also conducted research with Salvinorum A and MDMA. And given his pioneering research, he's sought, sought after speaker and has been interviewed widely in the media. Uh, and you, some of you made the probably uh, links below, you may have used them in the, from the blurb that we sent out. As you're gonna to hear today, he's a very natural and effective speecher, speaker and teacher, or speecher, if you put those two things together. And as a final note, in addition to his work with psychedelics, he's published extensively in behavioral pharmacology and decision-making, including papers that caught my attention early on about the impact of cocaine on sexual decision-making in humans. But for his talk today, he's gonna to focus on the promise of psychedelic treatment for tobacco use disorder. And I don't have to remind you all that it's a very challenging disorder that takes more lives each year than all the illicit drugs combined. Take it away, Matt. Thank you so much, Anna Rose. Uh, appreciate the introduction. I have to say, like the, the yeah, I've had my hands in a lot of different topics. With a positive spin, I could call that a diversified portfolio. But frankly, the other way to say it is I've been scattered across behavioral pharmacology. <laughs> so I did good work. <laughs> Whatever is interesting to me, doesn't matter what the con, they're all interesting, all these psychoactive compounds and the good, the bad, the ugly of, of so many of them. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity to present uh, some of this work for you all. I will focus on um, not just the psychedelic research, but even within that uh, uh, range of psychedelic work, that this line of research you know, using this compound psilocybin to help to see if we can get people to quit tobacco smoking. Um, let's see, so hopefully you're seeing now my, my slides and uh, some disclosures that I have. Uh, these are all companies that are, uh, I've advised over the last, either currently or sometimes over, over the last few years that have an interest in, that are moving uh, compounds, psychedelics or related compounds along the FDA pathway for potential approval, but I'm not going to be speaking about any of these uh, companies uh, today. Um, uh, or any of the work that they have uh, they have provided. Um, so I'm going to be talking about, of course, psilocybin. Uh, it's it's in over 200 species uh, known so far of, of so-called magic mushrooms, mostly in the psilocybe genus of mushrooms. Pharmacologically, the psilocybin is a classic psychedelic. Now, the term psychedelic is used a lot, which is really it, Psychedelic without additional, you know, classification is really kind of a very broad to, um, in a way, inhalants, which always has annoyed me in behavioral pharmacology. It's like, well, anything you can inhale, like, well, you know, puffing gasoline versus, you know, nitrous oxide versus, you know, cocaine base versus tobacco, you know, it's just like, you know, all these things are inhaled. I know typically the smoked things aren't called inhalants, but even to put some of these, you know, nitrous oxide and volatile anesthetics in the same categories, a little bit silly. So, you know, because it's divorced from their actual pharmacological mechanisms. Same thing here. Um, so some compounds such as MDMA or salvinorin has been mentioned, you know, PCP and ketamine, the NMD antagonist, ibogaine, which is a weird one that has all kinds of distinct multiple distinct mechanisms, but those are not classic psychedelics. The classic psychedelics pharmacologically, we know, exert their primary effects by agonizing, so serving as agonist or partial agonist at the serotonin 2A receptor specifically. And all those other drugs I talked about have different primary mechanisms of action. So for example, MDMA, very, you know, 
substantial overlap in effects, but certainly uh, distinct enough based on those mechanisms. That's a, a, a serot broad-based serotonin releaser um, as opposed to working postsynaptically at a subtype of, of serotonin uh, receptor site, the two-way. The other classic psychedelics, LSD, mescaline, uh, dimethyltryptamine, which is in the South American sacrament, ayahuasca, if you've heard, if you've heard of that. Um, uh, so most of what I'm going to say about, you know, psilocybin, you know, we need to test things specifically for all the drugs, but it's a decent bet, like with other drug classes, that a whole lot of what I say about the general profile of psilocybin, it's going to, by and large, have a huge overlap with uh, LSD and the other classic psychedelics. Same way, for example, if we compare two different you know, benzodiazepines, you know, shades of gray of difference, but primarily effects, effects being the same. Psilocybin itself has a fascinating uh, history and prehistory. In fact, I'm showing you some artifacts um, from Meso in South America on the, on, on the left and center, dating back several hundred to a few thousand years ago, but really on the right showing you the most ancient potential uh, evidence. This is from Algeria, northern Africa, um, a cave painting dated to an estimated 9,000 years ago. And if you can't, uh, if you can't see, there are um, little uh, uh, shape of mushrooms, like their heads are giant mushrooms, and in each hand is a mushroom, or at least in some of their hands there's mushrooms, and they're dancing around. Um, Perhaps not unlike the little chain of dancing Grateful Dead bears. You just, you know, not, not to arguable, but you know, suggestive, we should say. And apparently the climate scientists uh, tell us that these mushrooms would have grown and did grow in this climate at that time, even though they don't now. So um, that would truly, that is truly ancient. I mean, this is several thousand years before the first human civilization pop, popped up in Me Mesopotamia. So, um, yeah, quite quite impressive this this prehistorical record of a, of apparent use. So now we fast forward through uh, some millennia, get to that first era of psychedelic research um, in modern science. Um, this was really prompted by the the synthesis and discovery of psychoactive effects of LSD in the late '30s and or early '40s. Um, by Hoffman in, in Switzerland working for a pharmaceutical um, company, Sandoz, is now Novartis. Um, and, and that really, and, and Sandoz was sending um, samples of LSD to um, really what was called at the time, uh, you know, researchers, but you really just had to be a clinician saying, willing to try this out on your patients. And that was, that was research, but they would send it out to physicians really around the world, you know, with the idea of, hey, we think this stuff has profoundly powerful effects on the mind and help us figure out how to make a use out of this stuff. So that was really their interest in Thank sending so it out there and seeing how folks might you know, utilize this in, in, in therapy, in psychotherapy. Um, and, there were and there were some basic research questions. Um, there were some initial hypotheses that maybe the reason these psychedelic compounds have such powerful effects is that they are um, having a similar action as, as an endogenous um, ligand that somehow is responsible for um, uh, naturally occurring diseases like schizophrenia. Um, so it turned out to nothing turned out to be um, that that particular story didn't turn out to be credible. But there were other mechanistic, you know, questions and just the discovery of LSD was really um, concurrent with this um, shift in understanding of really moving toward biobehavioral. Um, uh, understanding, uh, you know, a biobehavioral model in psychiatry rather than an older psychodynamic primarily based model. So the whole idea that just that the, the brain was essentially you know, operated by electrochemical messaging, what, that was a new thing. And the discovery of LSD happened at a time when, um, around when it was discovered that serotonin, which had already been known to exist in the gut, like, oh, when we grind up rat brains, lo and behold, oh, you know, um, serotonin is there too. Oh, and that's really interesting because serotonin showed a remarkable um, structural similarity to this super potent new compound with these powerful mental effects, LSD. So the whole thing sort of triangulated um, um, in terms of um, really being one of the threads at the at the early in the early days of, of modern neuroscience. 
But in terms of the therapeutic um, applications, the two biggies were using LSD for cancer-related distress. These were terminal cancer patients. And in addiction, the treatment of alcoholism. And, and then despite some promising Request for or less. Yeah, early findings. I looked, um, um, please please right be now. careful and mute That's yourself right. if you're not. Dr. Joy has gotten a head start. Can you say that? I really told you. I don't know. I, I keep plowing um, through. Did I send her this? I mean, this is going to be very confusing. Um, can, can you also, please? Also, what yes. I noticed is the first thing we need to go on there and do, like my office is on there. Um, I'm not fucking yeah. talk to somebody Folks, there. we have, <clears throat> we need um, some muting. I would think that um, they'd want to know which door is on there. Sorry. I'm a little concerned <laughs> there's a private That's conversation. That's the non-hydro system, right? Maybe. That's proximity. <laughs> Could we okay. ask? Please. I don't know what this means. Is that proximity? The 9,000? Uh, 9,000 system, I would think. Well, if this, someone has all of these those controls, there. you can mute. I them can try to mute. I don't know what other columns can... Chris, if you're oh, on, can you mute? I mean, this is us here. Sorry. Oh, but that's not, that's the door back here. I assume so. I, I didn't know we were 2-2-A, two, two though. I didn't know we were A. Well, there were number four. No, we're not A. It's up to you. If you want me to try to go <laughs> forward, I can try to. Uh, just Hang for one second, Matt. Let's okay, see. it might be worth to talk over <laughs> this message. I'm thinking it's the main entrance. Main entrance. You know, <sighs> but I don't know. That stairwell number four is this one right here. Does um, anyone know, know this speaker? Dave Oslin. <laughs> I recognize his voice. Okay, could we ask him to please mute? All is quiet. Go ahead. Okay. And... Thank you. I'll move forward. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, these are these are the first world problems in the yeah, in 2022. <laughs> first things can happen. Um, classic oh, okay. issue. Um, so then, despite some early promising findings, there are the, the dark ages, which was essentially this isn't going a couple to be of set a, a they decade to... of uh, they have to... yeah. Um, of, of you know, where there was essentially no human research, although animal research was was continuing, and a lot of our mechanistic discoveries that were critical in, in determining um, how these compounds work were actually um, uh, discovered in those days. The fact that it was serotonin two A as the primary site of action, um, for example, happened during the, those periods. But there there was this decades long dormancy, and so this was a reaction to. Um, I, I like to remind people there were very and still are, um, but particularly when we're talking about the late 1960s, early 70s, um, quite a few casualties. Um, uh, the doses of LSD on the street, which was the primary psychedelic by far that was people were using in the late 60s, early 70s, and those doses were about six times what the doses of LSD are these days. So back in the day, it was like average dose was 300 micrograms. Those are extremely high doses. Um, there were quite a few people that had um, psychiatric problems after being exposed to these high doses. Um, you know, some people with psychiatric vulnerability, and of course, you know, a lot of users were you know young people using in you know some of the most reckless situations with sort of like the blind leading the blind, not always in the, the safest and, you know monitored settings. So there were some real casualties, um, but. Well, one more point there. It wasn't just the casualties, but also the sensationalism. I mean, it unfortunately the there was there was a shift in the media from the mid '60s to then the the very late '60s, where the media coverage was sort of like it was today. It was like nothing but positive. You know, you couldn't it's like you couldn't get a bad story published. You know, as a journalist, past your editor, you know about psychedelics. But then it flipped to like you couldn't get a positive story published. Um, in particular, you know, some of the, the the nails in the coffin there were, for example, at the very at, in, at the end of the '60s, Charles Manson and, and the whole the Tate murders. Um, I mean, this was like long before OJ. For those who remember even that, you know, a few decades before that, that was like the very first like society wide like true crime, like every you know capturing national and international like attention. And, you know, this guy was essentially using LSD as part of his brainwashing of, of young people to, to commit these horrible murders and, and to believe this like crazy ideology about a, a race war that was coming. And so 
it sort of shifted things like, yeah, this isn't just stuff that make your kids weird and have them put flowers in their hair, but like, yeah, they could also become psychotic, like, you know, uh, homicidal maniacs too. So there was a huge shift. Um, so there was that sensationalism of really failing to distinguish between the risk benefit profile that you got with, you know, your typical young people, teenagers using it on their own, which certainly had some risk and, and certainly the extreme stuff like you saw with, you know, Charles Manson, you know, versus, you know, medical, you know, research, medical practice where, you know, there was, um, you know, there were, uh, safeguards in in place, and there were to be clear, there was some um, wacky research that did not attend to safeguards, but there were quite a few responsible researchers who were begging those other researchers to um, you know tone down the sensational language and to you know keep doing things safely. Um, so, so that were, those are the dark ages. You could say this is the age of enlightenment we're in now. Um, in terms of the research, you know, actually just being open to human research, um, there uh, it's been called the psychedelic research, uh, psychedelic research renaissance. So I'm showing you PubMed hits for psychedelic or hallucinogenesis in, in the title of papers, and it just just bounced around for a few decades between five, 10, 20 papers a year, and then you get to the early 2000s, around the time when I I started work in this area, and, and it was around a time when there was just like just the start of this exponential like uptick in interest. Um, and even though a good amount of that is animal work and mechanistic work, um, I'd say the big driver has been some of the really remarkable therapeutic findings, um, some of which I'll show you in a little tobacco smoking cessation. I don't like giving a talk without at least mentioning there's certainly risks of these compounds. They are powerful psychoactive agents. I mean, perhaps amongst the most powerful psychoactive agents, depending on how one might want to define that. Um, I don't have time to go extensively through, through the, all the major risk factors, but um, I've written about that in publications over the year. I'm showing you uh, two major ones uh, uh, here that you could you know, uh, seek out for further reference. But the kind of the two biggies are that it does appear through clinical observation that people with the predisposition to schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders, that those um, those people can be destabilized and have, um, it, it may precipitate a first break in the vulnerable or it might exacerbate the disease for someone uh, with active disease. And, and I sort of liken, to my eye, it, it really looks like you know, the way that, that other unstable, dramatic, you know, intense life events can have that deleterious effect on these vulnerable individuals um, you know, major life stressors, very intense experiences, um, that can happen with these compounds. And so, you know, it's, you know, the urban legend of the person that trips and never comes back and the drug is metabolized. So, but, so that's not quite the way it works, but there's a kernel of truth to that. The idea that some people can be profoundly destabilized. I mean, I just put it simply, if, if, if you're hanging on to consensus reality by a thread, which is one way to put you know, I know there's, you know, the, the various forms of schizophrenia and there are differences, but if you're, generally speaking, that's a way to characterize it, then, you know, if you're hanging by a thread to consensus reality in one way, shape, or form, the last thing you need is one of the a high dose of a, of a psychedelic, which can have a profound impact and at least temporarily altering one's, you know, perceived interface with reality. Um, and, and then the, the more common one from anyone would be a bad trip. That's I call them challenging experiences in the context of of research and, and clinical care, because in fact, often you know these difficult experiences subjectively are after the fact highly valued as learning experiences, and it could take many forms. Sometimes it people looking at hard truths about themselves. Sometimes it's just kind of a nameless fear that that nonetheless at least some people find value in having you know gone through and stayed with it and not and gone out the other side some sense of efficacy i've had people in the smoking cessation work say gosh if i can go through that experience where i thought i was dying go you know, through it i can i can go through five minutes of you know craving for a cigarette um so uh the the bad trip is something that um even under the best of circumstances like in, in the studies I've been involved with, about a third of the people at a high dose will say at some point 
it was, you know, strong fear, anxiety, et cetera, what you could call a bad trip or a challenging experience. The really bad thing is that if someone does something that they panic, engage in dangerous behavior, and they harm themselves, that somehow that bad experience led to lasting harm of some type. And so that does occasionally happen. It shouldn't be a surprise in the, in the wild, so to speak. These are very intoxicating substances. Sometimes people panic and they, yeah, they, and there can be an escalation. Someone's at a concert, they get freaked out by people around them and they act weird. And then, you know, the cops get involved and the paramedics get involved. And, you know, that just kind of increases the react, the negative reaction. Now they have reason to be paranoid because people really are, trying, you know, um, you know, concern, you know, out the, you know, um, you know, observing them. And so these, the really bad thing is again, people getting in that sort of like trouble, dangerous behavior in the external environment. Um, I won't go through all the other, you know, potential risks. I'll say one form of risk that's typically there for most drugs of abuse, but it's not there for these classic psychedelics appears to be addiction. So by that, I, I mean, compulsive drug seeking. I mean, Every level of analysis, you know, from, you know, epidemiology, especially if you make sure that, you know, other classes like in NBA antagonists like PCP aren't included, but if you're just talking about the classic psychedelics, epidemiology, you know, the, you know, the neuroscience, you know, these don't work and they don't affect the mesolimic reward system the same way that all of the other drugs that can, that lead to habitual use can. Um, um, and you know, reliable animal models of self-administration. These these drugs typically look like punishers rather than reinforcers. Um, in other words, an animal will they press bar and they get an injection of some of this stuff. They'll tend not to press that bar again, and under most conditions. So um, it appears they're they're not drugs of addiction, and they they could certainly be abused. And, and by that, I mean used in a way that can bring harm to the self or others. So that shouldn't be a surprise at all. Um, this is the, the tip, what a typical clinical model looks like. The, 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 so much of the work has happened in the preparation, depending on the study, four to eight hours of preparing with the two monitors or guides, the two people in this therapist-like role. They're not always nominal therapists, depending on the nature of the study, but, you know, you can speak more generically about a guide. Um, they, they're, uh, they prepare with these two people for those four to eight hours across multiple sessions. And then really the idea is to build that rapport so that they could, you know, that a guy can reassure that patient should they be distressed, you know, have one of these challenging experiences. So, and to be clear, even with the, all the, with the various ther different therapeutic targets in these studies that have been examined, it's been the same clinical treatment model in the sense that during the session itself, the person is told to wear eye shades and, and headphones through which music is played. And they're told to, to pay attention to their inner experience, to trust and, and, and let go into the experience, to really just introspect, try not to overanalyze it, try not to resist the urge to just to describe, you know, your experience to the, to the guides all day, you know, um, if they do, you know, it's not like we told them to stop talking, but there's an art of like you know, encouraging them to go inside and focus on their experience, but then to discuss it afterwards. Um, and I'll tell you a little more about what we do in preparation with the smoking cessation work and a little later on regarding the, um, the behavioral therapy component. But why, first, why would we expect this to help treat addiction? I mean, we, um, uh, you know, I, Explain to you, it doesn't appear that people become addicted to, you know, psilocybin itself, but it's quite a different thing to say this could help people overcome an addiction. Um, you know, one, one reason is that just to, to quickly go over some previous work with healthy um, participants, is these are not therapeutic studies. Um, previous work that I, I and colleagues have done uh, have shown that highly meaningful experiences and that the, the, and and and, and self-claimed improvements in mood and quality of life over a year later. And we've also gotten those claims from um, a community observers, so spouses, partners, coworkers, friends of, of um, participants in studies. And in these high attributions, for example, in this study, I won't go into the details, but this first study our group did with psilocybin compared to an active control of methylphenolate, which is a stimulant, um, Ritalin, 
uh, you know, attributions of, of spiritual significance were extremely high. I mean, this is not a typical you know, behavioral pharmacology measure, but the, you know, the, the large majority of participants said that this experience on psilocybin was amongst the five most spiritually significant of their lives. And that you know, dwarfed what you would, as you would expect, dwarfed uh, methylphenidate. And really remarkably, um, it's remarkable someone make that attribution two months later, but then that was virtually unchanged 14 months later. And then more to the point of addiction treatment, you know, allegations of positive behavior change. Now, this was idiosyncratic as everyone comes with their own issues and work therapeutic studies. Some people say I was inspired to improve my diet. Some people say I'm easier going. Some people say this, that, and the other. Um, hard to make a whole lot of sense out of it because it is so idiosyncratic, but suggestive that we have something that could affect behavior change. And this was a second study of healthy normals that our, our group did um, looking at, uh, at a true placebo plus four active doses of, of psilocybin. And, uh, and, and despite some of these, you know, you know really interesting, um, again, non-traditional measures of high, for example, high attributions of personal meaning and spiritual significance, Nonetheless, we found really systematic dose-related effects, as you can see here. So it's clearly, it's, it, the set and setting or context does make a big difference, but it's clearly not the only thing going on because five milligrams is virtually indistinguishable from a placebo, but then you have a, a graded, you know, monotonic increase with, you know, one of these kind of non-traditional measures, such as the percentage of, you know, participants rating it amongst the five top, top type top five spiritually significant of their lives, and you get this like beautiful monotonic increase. Um, we also found in, in, in combining across those two different healthy normal studies that, um, that psilocybin led to an increase in one of the big five personality domains, openness to experience, which is tolerance for other people's points of view, the ability to hold, you know, kind of mutu seemingly mutually um, uh, exclusive uh, notions at the same time, kind of thinking in a, in a both and rather than either or framework, and an increased appreciation for art and other forms of aesthetics. So this refers to personality openness, and and which, by the way, typically decreases across the decades of the lifespan. But we found that uh, that psilocybin uh, increased personality openness when we pulled across these two studies, which is interesting because right personality isn't supposed to change by any key intervention. That's kind of the, the definition of personality. It's a trait. So it's quite remarkable. And this has now been you know, replicated by other labs. Um, so I think there's a very strong reason to believe that this is, has some relationship to do with, for example, why could this help treat addiction? Well, you know, you got to be open to change. And I, I see it in, in smoking. It's, it's all, a, you name the form of addiction, but just this people being stuck in this narrative where they've tried to quit so many times. It's a learned helplessness. I'm just a smoker. That's just it. My brain's too used to it for so many years. One has to be open to, to moving out of that. And so I, I really think that this, this is, is an important finding that is underlying some of those therapeutics. I, I should say quickly that last point here that we found that it was a certain type of subjective experience that someone had during their psilocybin session that was predictive. It wasn't just getting psilocybin. Um, it was whether they had one of these so-called mystical experiences that seemed to drive that. Now that sounds woo-woo, um, but it's, it's, a, it, 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 it's a psychological construct describing a subjective experience. It is nominally distinct from any supernatural belief. So it really just is about someone's experience, their subject, subjective reported experience. And it, William James, the father of American psychology, was fascinated, even outside of psychedelics, of, with these mystical experiences, with the idea that humans across the centuries, across the globe, um, across different languages, tend to have certain remarkable experiences that share some extraordinary similarities, whether it's prompted by something like prolonged fasting or meditation or acoustical techniques or uh, substances or sometimes just out of the blue and the common out or, or near death experience, I should say, some sort of near death event. But those similarities being people reporting the sense of unity, such as all is one, a positive mood, a transcendence of time and space as if stepping outside of the domains of time and space. 
an ineffability, the sense that it's beyond words. So that's the mystical experience. We have ways to measure that. We've done some psychometric development in, in terms of how to measure this in terms of a, a, a single acute experience. But um, we found in that early work that it was really those people that demonstrate that met an arbitrarily but predefined threshold for a quote unquote complete mystical experience addressing all of the major domains of mystical experience. Those are the people that saw that pre post increase in personality openness, not the people that had psilocybin who fell short of a complete mystical experience. And I should say, this is all meant the mystical experience is measured when the session has worn, the, the drug has worn off but before they go home. So we're talking about, you know, here, you know, um, yeah, pre prediction of whether they would, that predicting whether they would have this change in personality measure, in this case, one or two months later, depending on which of the two studies they came from. So another reason outside of the healthy normal research we think it might help with uh, addiction is the, the, there's this anthropological literature across multiple classic psychedelics from that indigenous uh, societies or um, ceremonially, so ceremonial use by syncretic religions have reported anti-addiction effects, addiction recovery coming from either you know, the use of ayahuasca by South American based religions or the use of uh, peyote by the Native American church, all you know, the classic psychedelic compounds in those um, you know, sacraments used by those religions. And of course, you know, that's observational and we you know a religious involvement can be associated with addiction recovery in general. So, you know, grain of salt there, but there are some pretty remarkable anecdotes if you read particularly these, some of these early papers on um, Native American uh, uh, you know, recovery from alcoholism uh, uh, you know, through participation in the Native American church. It's, it's quite compelling, the stories. But then you also had those studies that referred to earlier LSD and treating um, uh, alcoholism, as it was referred to in, in, in those days, uh, alcohol use disorder, we would, would call it now. But the, some, it was reported as a mixed literature. I, I think rightfully so. Um, you know, some, find, some studies reported significant effects and some didn't, but there were only six randomized studies that randomized people to LSD or some other condition. A meta-analysis a decade ago found that actually the, the, the trend for every single study was for LSD to have um, group to, to do better. As I'm showing you here, this is the, 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 the odds of, uh, ratio of, of the patients being improved at the first follow-up, the timing of that follow-up differed across the studies. But, you know, as you could see, you know, some of the confidence intervals cross one, and that would be anything to the right of the line, the center line would, would show uh, uh, LSD subjects doing better and anything to the left, you know, the control condition did better, and that one would be their identical. And so you could see why some studies fell short of significance in, in in the meta-analysis, it was clearly an aggregate statistically significant, but more important, uh, uh, of course, is the effect size in you know, essentially doubling an odds ratio of about two, doubling the chance of success of the first follow-up. Um, and then there was a bit of evidence, one study uh, conducted, published in 73, using LSD to treat uh, uh, opioid dependencies or heroin users in Baltimore, and found really high, there were some differences, it wasn't perfect, it, there was a brief inpatient stay the LSD group had that the other group didn't, but they had urine verification of results, which was not, you know, the most common thing in 1973, and showed some big differences a year after treatment in favoring the LSD group. So certainly in that category, like this was worth, really worthy of, I mean, how many opioid epidemics have we gone through since 1973, <laughs> like, you know, multiple. So you know, it's a kind of type of stuff, it's a shame that we didn't jump on it sooner. So with kind of that, that, that kind of backdrop, it seemed like there's this potential for this cross substance of abuse, anti-addiction potential. In other words, it's, you know, unlike most of addiction medicine, it's not about, you know, agonizing the particular receptor that mediates the drug of abuse's effects, you know, to, to reduce reinforcement and craving from the for that drug, but it operates at a deeper level, obviously with biological effects, but prompting a psychological experience that might have more of a broad-based anti-addiction effect. And, uh, uh, and and so, you know, why not smoking? You know, it's something I had a lot of experience with studying smoking, going back to my grad school days. It's very quantifiable. Um, 
And it's kind of a problem in and of itself. You know, more people die from smoking than all the other drugs, legal and illegal combined. So, hey, let's give it a shot. Had no idea if it would work. So just and didn't have much money. So hustled up a little bit of money to do a small pilot study. Um, quickly, the results, these were only 15 people. Um, we combined it and, and they weren't lightweights. They'd been smoking on average uh, about uh, uh, 30 years, smoked on average just under a pack. So not lightweights. It was a 15 week protocol with weekly meeting. We use sort of standard cognitive behavioral therapy, talk therapy for helping people quit smoking. Things like keeping a smoking diary, preparing to quit, removing your ashtrays, things like that. Um, uh, dur during, you know, throughout this entire study period, there were three psilocybin sessions over an eight week period, starting at a moderate and then moving to a, a higher dose. The first psilocybin session was on our target quit date. So this is a big day for people. So not only are they going to quit smoking, which is a really, really big deal, right? right? You know, you might be really stressed out and you're going to be pulling your hair out potentially and all of this, but we're also going to have this session and we really prepare people. You know, I tell people routinely, like we have people that say this is the most intense experience of their life. I've had multiple vets tell me this was the most difficult, you know, intense thing that they've gone through. I mean, you know, it's, it's a, uh, there are more anecdotes than any, you know, I couldn't top that. I mean, people who have been through more intense experience than I have are saying this tops it for them. So, you know, tell, like you tell people, you may feel like you're dying. You know, this is a very safe drug at the physiological level, but you may feel like you're actually dying and we'll be there with you helping you through the experience. And so that's a really, people are often very nervous to do this as you could imagine. So not only that, you're gonna quit smoking too. So it's a big day for people. So I'll jump to the, the, the results. We did carbon monoxide and urine codeine, two bio, biological measures. Um, and so these were the, the median CO uh, readings on the meetings before the target quit date versus after. Clearly we saw a pre-post difference. Um, you don't need much in the way of inferential stats to see you have a difference there. Looking at the data in another way, this is seven day point prevalence. This is at each point in time after. Um, the treatment, you know, what percentage of participants at that point in time are absent both by their own self-report and by both of the biological you know, measures, breath and the urine samples. And so that held up, you know, very high uh, at six months, 80%, and at a very long-term follow-up at an average of two and a half years, which we kind of tacked on, got another study approved. So 30 months or two and a half years, um, 60%. So it's a non-randomized study, a single sample, open label, so limited conclusions, but we were, were very encouraged. And just give you an example why we were encouraged, probably didn't need to include this for, for this group, uh, but, but nonetheless, it's, it, you know, I like to tell people why I was encouraging going forward in the context of a, just a, a small pilot where, you know, you, your limited conclusions, just the absolute rates we, we see here this, I'm showing you continuous abstinence at 12 months. So another way of looking at the data, this means if you've had a single cigarette, you know, over that entire year, you're, you're forever in the failure column. It, it's, so it's, the, it's overly stringent, but it's the most stringent measure. So over 50%, you know, in our data were continuously abstinent um, at the 12 month follow-up. And that just kind of swamps like the best treatments out there. Um, varenicline C, and I've tried to here pull from the you know most you know, typical values in the literature, so it's arguable. But these were from different studies, different populations. Major grain of salt here. The whole point is just to show for those not very familiar with what you typically get a success rate. This is why I was so excited to move forward into a more controlled study because yeah, the success rates were really high. Um, and then like the healthy normal research, and like I haven't shown you, but we found for cancer. Um, patients and some other samples that the, the, the long-term therapeutic effect here also seem to show some relationship to the degree of mystical experience as measured on the session day. And we've also done qualitative analysis um, at the same time as our, our um, long-term follow-up that I, I mentioned. So on average, two and a half years after the treatment, we asked people if it helped you, did it help you? Um, was the psilocybin what helped you quit? And if so, how do you think? These psilocybin sessions help you, and people said things like that gave them a sense of interconnectedness, all curiosity that lasted. They said it reduced withdrawal symptoms. Um, they said they had other positive psychological changes that somehow took their focus off of smoking. So this increased appreciation for aesthetics and altruism. 
Um, and they, they reported any idiosyncratic insights into self-identity, including reasons for smoking. Now, as a scientist, I don't know how much of this is post hoc, you know, rationalizations and how much, you know, might actually have some call to roll. But nonetheless, it seemed that people formed narratives. They, they seemed to at least think that they figured out something about their sm I mean, smoke. I remember one person that recalled how he had quit years before, but had started back up because of after his father's funeral, and, and that was such a bonding experience. He smoked with his father, and that was a very meaningful part um, of his relationship to smoking. And so anything like that, th these sessions tend to kind of like raise those kind of narratives, it seems. Um, and, and then people, these are just a few quotes. One person said, primarily, I would say it made me understand that, that, um, that my identity is this construct. I've learned to be more grateful. Um, I've, I've given all these uh, lessons about um, in the session telling me, here's what you need to do so you don't get depressed. And what do we know about that relationship between you know, affective disorders and addiction, that is transagnostic factors, seeing what happened during the psychedelic session and being reminded um, uh, of, of, uh, of an understanding life is an unspeakably marvelous uh, uh, adventure of existence. So I, 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 I'm, tr I see that the, the the picture of people on the side and something it covers my text, so that's why I'm in trouble. I read some of the text. But I apologize for that uh, that delay there. Um, I'm more accepting of myself. So just looking across these different quotes, just something. A lot of things people say don't have anything to do with smoking. And again, like it does seem that if, if people are kind of checking in at this more of this narrative level about their life and kind of drawing on you know, coming up with lessons that seem to have some relationship to smoking. And yeah, I think, you know, again, like, hey, here's how to not get depressed. Like that's useful when you're attempting to quit smoking. Um, so now uh, showing you the last bit, our current study, the randomized comparative efficacy trial. This is for 80 treatment resistant smokers. They're randomized to a single session of psilocybin or a standard um, course of nicotine patch uh, treatment. Um, only a single session, not because I don't think multiple is better. Um, I think probably two is the sweet spot, but we scaled down um, in part for experimental reasons in the, in, in the, um, um, in, in the, in the study I'm going to show you um, because we're doing some fMRI before and after, and it kind of creates noise experimentally if, for example, you didn't have a very meaningful initial session, but you did two weeks later. Um, and it's the same cognitive behavioral therapy as the first study. One, and uh, I'll show you the data where we're at now. It's an open label, but randomized efficacy study. So in other words, it's treated like um, you would study novel psychotherapy where blinding is not possible. Um, randomized people who are willing to do both and, uh, and, and, and you know, track their outcomes um, and compare it to you know a known standard. So it's ongoing, but you know since it's open label, I can kind of dip into the data at any point in time and tell you where we're at. So these are not official results, but just the snapshot of where we're at right now. But kind of like the previous study, it's it's a uh, in terms of the sample, they're not lightweight. They've been smoking on average over twenty five years. Smoke you know three quarters or more of a pack a day. Um, and let's see, huh, skip past the most important slide, our current <laughs> uh, efficacy results here. Um, I'm showing you at, uh, at 12 months for the 61 people that have gotten to their 12 month follow-up and the psilocybin group, we're seeing a 52% um, uh, success rate uh, at the, again, at the 12 month, you know, point prevalence abstinence, 52% compared to 27% for the nicotine, which is, which is on the upper range, I would say, you know, in the, in the very good range of what you would expect from nicotine replacement therapy a year after treatment. So proud of that in the context of an open label study um, that our comparison arm is, is, seems to be doing uh, as well as one might expect. But nonetheless, at this point in time, still being dwarfed by the psilocybin um, group. So that's encouraging. Um, so let's see, getting, I think I'll 
I'll skip really fast through this just to say on, in an earlier stab at the data with 27 folks, we did see some, some evidence using the MSIT task, a measure of cognitive interference, somewhat related to the Stroop task where people were um, have improved performance in the psilocybin group. Um, this is the day, the, the day after their psilocybin um, session. Um, so we see a significant improvement in um, cognitive control as measured by, in other words, they have this less of a slowing of reaction time when they're presented with conflicting information for making a response. So that might be akin to the idea that people seem to be saying that they're more mindful after these sessions. They're not sort of blindsided by cravings, the sort of automaticity that's often described with smoking. Uh, we've also done a, a number of, of, of survey studies of people where they say they, they took these things typically just for fun, but you know they, they ended up you know, quitting or substantially reducing some addictive substance. So we've, we've published stories with alcohol and tobacco and cocaine and uh, methamphetamine and cannabis. A lot of stories out there. Um, again, doesn't prove anything like the open label work, but one of the patterns that jumped out in this study of, of people who make this claim um, that they quit smoking because of a psychedelic is, is um, asking them to compare their withdrawal effects compared to other times when they quit smoking. And I was really struck that the modal response on this Likert type scale was that for the you know, physical withdrawal symptoms, folks say, yeah, it's about the same when I've quit smoking before. But when you get the affective symptoms, anxiety, restlessness, depression, low mood, irritability, craving, the modal response is not just less severe, but much less severe. So this to me is tying in that thread to like, how is this stuff helping people with major depressive disorder? How is this helping cancer patients who are you know, potentially dying of, of, you know, of cancer and it helps with their depression and their anxiety is providing this kind of clue across uh, diagnostic uh, efficacy. And I'll go quick here just to say that very similar line of trajectory has been done by my colleague, Mike Bogenschutz at now at New York University, recently pub published a promising pilot uh, with 10 people, psilocybin for alcohol use disorder, and has then very recently, about a, a few weeks ago, published a, a larger, about a 90-some person randomized uh, study, which still looked and found significant effects for um, alcohol use disorder. So big picture, we need to be thinking about common mechanisms, as, as I alluded to a few times. Um, looking at a whole lot of different uh, disorders going forward, I would say that you know, there's a lot of different compounds that need to be explored. There's an argument that these various disorders that we found success so far preliminarily are disorders characterized by a narrow behavioral repertoire. That's how I would characterize both you know, depression um, and these various substance use disorders, as well as the, the stress associated with cancer. Um, you know, people that are, you know, stuck in these very narrow mental, you know, and behavioral repertoires. Uh, often with these disorders, people recognize they're operating suboptimally, but it's easier said than done. Um, we need a whole lot of work to expand psychedelic therapy and explore it. Um, I mean, just thinking about these as learning, you know, rapid learning, uh, you know, interventions, like what do we know about learning, what the parameters of that, how can we orchestrate this to really leverage, you know, a more, more rapid and even more successful behavior change. Um, this whole this term integration, which is used to under, you know, basically discussing the session afterwards seems to be really important for helping people make clinical progress from it. But, you know, that's just clinical observation. We haven't, you know, we've never done a study randomizing whether you get have integration sessions versus not or what you talk about during that. So all of this needs to be looked at parametrically and experimentally. Um, and then finally, I'll leave every word of commentary I'll refer people to a couple of years ago, just a some of the pitfalls, one of the, the uh, this area, aside from the the nominal risk that is described earlier, this is a very kind of very sensitive intervention where you pretty routinely have people that you know claim that these are some of the most meaningful experiences of their life. That's really ripe for abuses of, of you know, sexual abuses and and just all of the abuses of power dynamics. And I I also think it's very important we have to. And I've disagreed with colleagues about this, that, that we really have to kind of keep a mainstream secular approach here. 
patients are free to make whatever you know metaphysical philosophical interpretations of these sessions but we're not we're not spiritual teachers that should not be what's going on here we just need to have that you know very empathetic that humanistic that that you know all the stuff that you know a good clinician you know would describe me having that positive you know positive um uh, interpersonal regard um, caring for the patient, creating a safe environment, but really letting them drive the bus when it comes to metaphysical interpretations of these experiences. We shouldn't be filling up the rooms with religious symbols and things of this nature. Um, and so with that, I'll wrap it up. Um, hopefully we have some time for questions. Just a whole, I've shown you a bird's eye view of a lot, but there's a whole lot of colleagues at Hopkins and elsewhere to thank and funders, um, you know, uh, for the you know, work that I've, I've shown you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. It's great. And we do have some comments in the chat. So let's take those. If if you can read them, that's great. If you can't, I'll read them out loud to you. Oh, um, sure. Yeah, I can. There's, they're I down. I won't make uh, you. You can see the comments. See. First is Liz Heller's comment, uh, I think. OK, are, are the feedback comments recorded? Oh, no, that's another good. Am I looking in the right section? It is, it is <laughs> right. Are, are the feedback comments recorded after the psilocybin session or after the abstinence period? Like, I guess this is the integration oh, of feedback. Yeah, you know, this is my question. I can elaborate. Just, um, you know, if the, the experiences that were, we were describing in the, in the tobacco cessation study of the, you know, value of the experience, if those comments were recorded immediately after the psychedelic experience or they were recorded after that, plus the abstinence period. So, so, for example, those attributions of the yeah. you know, how meaningful. So it depended on the study, but those were like in the first study, it was a, it was um, two months later, and in that second dose effect study, it was one month later that those attributions, you know, were made. So yeah, they're done at a at a longer time frame, which is why, you know, they're, it's one thing if someone says, "Oh, I just did this thing, and it was the most meaningful thing ever." Okay, like, we'll check in with you next week and see what you thought about it. I've known people that are into doing retreats and everything, and like you always say, like, oh, this thing I did yesterday was the most amazing thing ever. And I'll ask you a year later and see what you thought. Anyway, let's question. go down. Let's go down to the next one, Matt. If you want to read it. Yeah. So let's see. Um, Kyle Trenecki. Um, yeah. Can, can you elaborate on the role of CBT played in your study? Did all the participants under, undergo CBT in addition to? psilocybin sessions yeah so they all you know so you know unfortunately you know this work needs to be done in the future but didn't have a factorial design where some people got the cbt and some people didn't um one of the nuances there um is that if that ever i think that type of work is critical um and uh but a key there is that just the preparation for psilocybin which i think is ethically important is very therapeutic like itself just that rapport building. I would say it's unethical to just throw someone in these sessions without that several hours of rapport building. However, in terms of nominal CBT or content or, or anything else for a different, you know, um, line of research, you know, we need to move to the state phase where, yeah, we can tease this apart. Like, what does this look like with just that rapport building preparation, but with no CBT? Maybe it works just as good and we could skip all the CBT. Maybe CBT is really critical and you can't get it without, you know, without that. So we don't know, but they all got it here. Okay. All right. Go down to the next one from Carlo. Yeah. 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 Um, what is the typical duration of the experience? Five to six hours. Yeah. Pretty. Um, yeah. And then it's and then, into a business day. Yep. And then unlike Paul, LSD, which is like more of a 12 hour or more effect. So um, a little easier to deal with. And let's see what, what do Paul, you think Paul, is Paul more Regeer, important? Yep for long-term uh, change preparation for the session, the actual session itself. Um, can I can I elaborate on that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay, thanks. Uh, so uh, just, you know, reading up on this and, and the idea of what you're doing to prepare someone for the actual session will include things like what you've talked about. This is very powerful. You might feel like you're going to die. You're not actually going to die. People have these experiences. It's going to be very positive. And, uh, it feels like this is a tool that's going to open up whatever brain pathways are, are sort of locked in, maybe critical pathways or critical developmental periods, perhaps. Uh, so whatever you do leading up to the session feels like that's going to be the real important part. And certain people will be more receptive to that than the actual experience of 
you know, feeling like you might get like you're going to die. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a little hard to say because I'll put it this way. You know, it does seem like, you know, that preparation is critical. I mean, I mean, the, the, you do get a sense that, again, we haven't, it'd be great to refer to, you know, factorial studies where this has all been teased apart, but it's a strong clinical sense that, yeah, yeah, that preparation seems to be really important. And, and I showed you the survey studies, like, it's amazing that anyone ever says they, they just took a psychedelic for fun and then decided to quit smoking or, or whatever, quit drinking or whatever. But, you know, that's not the typical thing. I mean, I've had also plenty of people say like, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about this. Like, they used to go to dead or fish shows and they would smoke the whole time and eat mushrooms and they loved it. You know, like, what do you mean it makes you quit smoking? So it, obviously I think we're, you know, you, you know, you're, 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 you know, you're turning up the gain on the likelihood of the efficacy by having that, you know, that kind of, um, you know, that, that preparation and rapport building and all of that. But at the same time, I wouldn't say that's more important because frankly, without the psychedelic session, like it's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, you know, success rates aren't going to be, you know, I would imagine nearly as high as, as what they could be. But it, it, there's also like some really interesting interactions because I said this before that just the context of the fact that you're going to this session that could be so intense that you may feel like you're dying and all this stuff. And it might be, you know, one of these like very, very intense sessions that creates such a, a, a gravity to the preparation sessions. It's like, oh, compare that to anything else, like other psychotherapy. Like these are the people that say, like, I might actually feel like I'm going to die but they're going to be the ones holding my hand through it. Like that's a really heavy kind of like clinical gravity that you just, I think just don't have there in most clinical situations. So there's even an interaction between just the belief that you're going to have this very deep session it tends okay. to add a, a weight to the prep. All right. And there's one, the next one is from Hank Robb. Is there a measure for mystical experience being used? I think you mentioned some of the scales. Yeah, so it's it's evolved over time, but I'd say now you know, the what's called the MEQ thirty mystical experience questionnaire thirty item version. We've psychometrically validated that with both survey and um, uh, and laboratory data, based on working from an earlier version with forty three items, which was part of a larger questionnaire with hundred items. There's a whole clinical evolution of this, and there's other scales. There's this hood mysticism scale, which is really more psychometrically to validate it for measuring mystical experiences across one's lifetime, more as kind of a trait-like situation rather than measuring what happened during a particular experience. So I'd say the best thing, you know, and what we've had is MEQ 30. Hopefully I'll have a paper out soon validating a four item measure. It looks very, it looks almost, almost as good. It's nearly identical to the 30 item, but it's not published yet. But the MEQ 4, stay tuned for that. We've got some. <laughs> Short um, scales are always very popular. <laughs> so, <laughs> and Carl is also asking about. He probably asked this before you answered the typical duration. Um, but also, have he says, have you worked with smokers who are younger and not smoking so much? In other words, a less severe phenotype. Yeah, we have. Um, you know, we we've we'll have to see. I I don't. As we're nearing up this current study, and we actually have some numbers and some variability to work from, I'll have to dig into that. I don't have an answer now. My certainly we do have younger smokers, and we do have people that smoke. We have a range of people in terms of, um, uh, you know, the amount that they had to smoke five a day. But so we'll have that variability. But my, my impression is that it's not like oh, it's only working for the very heavy. It's only working for light. My impression is that that's not a big difference, but stay tuned as this current study is finishing up. And I think the final question in the chat is um, going a bit off the path, quote unquote, do you see any possible difference in the use of ACT as opposed to CBT during the psilocybin experience? Yeah, I mean, the, and, and some colleagues have written about this, that ACT is a, might be particularly good. And I think some folks at Yale are actually using ACT as a, uh, I, I'm assuming acceptance and commitment therapy is meant here um, as, as a backdrop for some of the depression work. Um, I mentioned Michael Bogenshoot's work with motivational, well, alcohol use disorder, but he's using motivational enhancement 
therapy, which includes, of course, motivational interviewing. So there's a number of, of different kind of nominal psychotherapeutic interventions that are being used in conjunction. For none of these disorders, is there any comparison of using that versus nothing or a comparison across, you know, like MET versus, you know, CBT? So much of it right now is shooting from the hip, you know, um, you know, because you got to, you know, you try something and as this field evolves, hopefully we'll get those answers. Personally, I'm not seeing, I'm not betting that there's going to be a huge difference there. I think that it, this could probably, uh, interface well with a wide variety of empirically validated. I mean, I would start with the, the interventions to combine it with, start with the ones that we have a pretty good empirical basis that they, they really do some good on their own. Even Nothing's perfect, but, um, but yeah, any sort of like, oh, this is the, you know, this is going to work so much better than that versus that. Yeah, My hands aren't there. This is sort of a meta question, and I know that your time is a little after four, but I just, are you surprised at where things are in the field now to see this sort of burgeoning interest after coming in on the ground floor and having to fight for funding? Uh, you've had quite a journey, as has everybody at Hopkins and these handful of other places. You want to say a yeah, it, about that, where you think it it's is going? surprising? I mean, I didn't know exactly. It, really, the commercial interest is just something I, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't anticipate it happening that quick. I mean, there's there's billions of dollars invested in this area now. I mean, there's hundreds of there are hundreds of companies um, in this psychedelic. You know, by and large, all focused on FDA and EMA and Health Canada approval. So, I mean, one of the things I always remind people that you know ask is like, this is very very different than the whole evolution of cannabis, medical cannabis. Like, this is. Yes, there are some state initiatives that have passed and decriminalization and even some like Oregon legalizing kind of quasi psychedelic therapy, but all of that is completely independent of this like work in, you know, moving things through the FDA pathway. And so I'm, I'm happy that it's, it's that, that this has happened because we need that. I, um, but it's made things very, very complicated. A lot of people have their pitchforks up that there's any commercialization at all psychedelics and I think that's frankly crazy because if you want this into the hands of pay you know, if you want this to actually help people in a safe way like you're going to need companies to fill that void there are a couple of nonprofits that are pushing these forward like maps and have to research group usona but there's never been a drug that's been developed as through a nonprofit and maintained on market as a nonprofit so those are noble experiments that I've very much contributed to and continue to do but None of those organizations think they're going to be fill the whole fill the whole niche that opens up. So that's been the biggest surprise is the degree to which and how like, oh, like I used to go to psychedelic meetings like, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And it'd be, you know, it'd be a few scientists and, and you know, a bunch of hippies. Now it's like it's all like like tech startup bro types. Like it's, <laughs> it's like, that's been a really silly and change. So yeah, yeah, it's been really surprising. Yeah, it's been just dramatic because I, you know, obviously you're very close up, but just I wondered how it looked to you from the distance. Anybody else in our in our current group that are signed on that would like to add something of Matt before we wind down? Obviously, you can follow on with email as well, but if there's something you'd like to share with the group. Hi, I, I just wanted to thank you for those last comments. You know, we can thank tech startup bros for the Juul uh, debacle and they're, you know, they're paying out the nose right now. So I appreciate that you're distinguishing, uh, you know, interests on this topic and, uh, and all of your comments about liability and, and potential dangers of these substances. So really exciting work and, and thank you for giving such a balanced talk today. Thank you. Yep. It's getting more complicated in terms of the potential for, and the, potential areas to watch out for, particularly when the big, big, big money's involved. Yeah. It'll be fascinating to see what happens when all the dust settles. So I, I so appreciate it and giving us the dust in the middle of the dust. Thank you so much. <laughs> we appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Anna Rose. Thank yeah. you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Bye-bye.